Hello, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Center of Business Excellence of the School of Economics and Business Ljubljana on today's eTalk. It's a special one since we'll talk about our brain, brain connects all, also in business. If you can understand the process of your own brain and how sensority, information, emotions and thoughts impact you and your behaviors, then you can begin to realize how it may impact the brain of others our employees, our business partners, our clients. But I'm not the one today who will do the talking. Let me introduce to you our guests who are all passionate about neuroscience and of course about the brain. Hi, everybody. Hi. Alyosha Valentin, professor of accounting and finance and also researching the field of neuro in finance. Nikolaos Dimitriadis, head of Neuro Consulting Services at Optimal HR Group, and mostly researching and lecturing about neuromarketing and neuro leadership. And Giga Vigentin, advisor to the management board and CMO at Pokoninska Druzba A, passionate about neuro in sales. And before we continue, I'm of course inviting all of you, our guests who are with us today, to write down your thoughts and questions in the comments directly on YouTube channel and our guests will try to answer them in the next hour. So now I'm passing the word to the three of you. What does neuroscience mean to each of you in the context of business and uh, in finance, leadership, marketing, and so on? Maybe Alyosha to start. Okay, hello everybody, thank you for joining. I got into this field about 10 years ago. I was listening to a presentation about how monkeys perceive rewards in terms of food and water. And the thing that shocked me was that the process of how do they feel about the food and, and the water was actually the same as one of the most complex con constructs we have in human history, the standard in accounting for recognition of revenue. So the standard appeared to be a direct trans transcription of biological processes that were hidden behind, um, behind monkeys consuming food and water. And this is where I got, uh, where I started to pay attention. So um, after that, the field expanded massively rapidly. And uh, all of a sudden we were questioning things like, do people that are in a bad mood actually trade differently on the stock exchange compared to people who uh, are, are in a good mood? Uh, we also noticed that people who have hormonal differences among themselves also trade differently. And the list went on and on and on. And then started, I started to think, how does this affect my work? And obviously, most of the days, at one point or the other, I would pull out the capital asset pricing model or the farmer French three or five factor model, and I would have to apply it. However, the inputs that are in there make no sense at the human level right now. And so this chain of events continued and continued. And uh, right now I can see uh, at least 15 different directions into which uh, I, I should be going probably in terms of the brain because they all affect uh, the numbers that we then deal uh, in the real world uh, in corporate finance, in accounting and financial statement analysis, be it the discount rate, be it the pricing, be it uh, analyst forecast and so on and so on. So the list is massive and hopefully will uh, discuss a little bit about this later on. If we slowly continue, if we continue with numbers and then slowly come to, to people, uh, maybe Giga, you are somehow in between. So finance, sales and uh, marketing. Um, how is in, in your field, in, in your everyday business with, with Neuro? Well, maybe to first to start, how did I come across this field? I could say a sort of stumbled upon it. Basically, I'm almost now 10 years in this pension fund business, and I'm in charge basically of marketing and sales for our fund. And my two jobs are to make all existing clients as happy as possible and have them the best services as possible and to get new clients. So when I was thinking, why don't people, and you know, if you don't know already, people don't save for retirement. They just don't on their own. So I consider myself quite a logical guy, quite a savings inclined guy. And I was wondering why don't others save the same as I do? The government provides tax incentives, 
Um, if you ask people on the street, everybody will say it's wise to save for retirement. Everybody should. And then you ask them, do you save? And they say, no, no, it's, it's so far away. It's, it's ah, I'd rather buy new shoes, whatever. So, you know, when I was looking for answers, you know, how to, how to be more successful in, in my job, um, how to uh, fulfill our goals, I started reading books. I think this is the best way to find answers. And I stumbled upon books from behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. And suddenly when I read a few, everything became clear and I became hooked to this ever since. So it became sort of my hobby and my work. So I'm really lucky now basically that I get to do things I really enjoy. I read the same books at work as I read at home in bed. So it's, it's as Alyosha said, the field is going crazy in the last few years. Their applications from various fields, various aspects. And now we also, the people who work in this field, we can focus only on one thing. I decided to focus on human behavior related to saving. Sam Alyosha focuses on capital market. Um, Nikolaus focuses on something else. So now when you read the literature, it's, it's a lot of things focused in different areas. And it's really cool to see how this field is expanding. And I think we can each, each bring to this expansion something from our own fields, experiment, publish something, share in, in, in talks like this, and also get other people excited in this field. So basically, it provided the answers to what, what I was looking for, how to be more successful in, a, in, in my daily job. This is how I, I, I came to this field. And maybe which book would you recommend for a starter? Oof, there are so many books. I think classics from behavioral economics, you can read Thaler, Shlomo Benazzi, Dan Ariely, just some easy books to get you into the field. And then I think each one needs to know basically what is your field and what is connected. I would really avoid the classics books that, that are just, I don't know, bias this, bias that. You really need to look at your business. You need, you know your business the best and then you really need to look, okay, what's happening here and really look with some critical distance and maybe not just go for the things that are nice to hear, but also, you know, some things that are nice to hear don't work in reality. I've tried many things in our found, most didn't work and I've learned it the hard way. So maybe don't just read some article on the internet and say, okay, this is that, I'm going to do this. You will be uh, 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 disenchanted, but just, I think, look for something that is related to your work test it a bit and, and see where it goes from there. And then just, just, just dig into and try to experiment, try to implement it in your business. That's, I think, the best advice I could give. But the, all three of you will share later on, you will share some tricks, tricks for different fields. Hopefully. Nikos, how, uh, maybe, yeah, where, where did you uh, firstly met, uh, met with? So it's amazing. I mean, thank you very, very much for inviting me. And uh, the fact that I share this panel with uh, these two amazing professionals makes me even more excited. And it shows immediately because I could relate to both stories. Um, with uh, Alyosha, I can remember myself as a young um, marketing academic uh, starting of 2000 when the first neuromarketing uh, uh, literature started appearing. I was very excited. I was trying to read what's, what's happening. Then later on, it started applied in other business fields. So I, I understand this Alyosha's viewpoint from studies that actually were quite uh, illum illuminating and enlightening and said, wow, but this, there is this aspect as well. And I can also relate with um, Giga in the professional aspect because um, also as a young marketing professional, consultant, part of companies and uh, advisor to major brands, I realized that the, the, the models that we, we were using to predict behavior and results were more based on luck than science. And although they were in scientific books and supported with a lot of blah, 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 you know, so, you open a textbook, it's full of, full of proven uh, models. But when you go to reality, you understand that as the, even the worst business student will tell you when he or she finishes school, say, these models, you know, I, I, they don't work. From the worst to the best students, this is exactly what they will tell you. And why they don't work? 
why why always we, we talked about theory and practice? Why we always we went to work into companies or to do a lecture and everyone says, yes, but let's not be theoretical, be practical. Why there is this distance between theory and practice? Because if we are honest enough, we we'll say theory was never meant to work. It was and, and why it was not meant to work? Because it didn't take a realistic view of what makes us human. So both from the academic knowledge uh, research side that Alyosha came in and for the practical managerial business side that Ziga came in, uh, I can really relate to this. But I have a, another story a little bit to, to share as fast as I can. So it was, I think, 97 when I experienced a, a car accident. Okay, It was not life-threatening, but it was quite, quite strong. And um, I remember that just, just before the, my car hit the other car, Okay, just before this few seconds, I realized that, that uh, uh, something was about to happen, that uh, there's going to be a crash, they're going to hit something. But I switched off, I blacked out just before the hit. So I have no recollection, no experience of the actual collision. It didn't happen in my consciousness. And then few seconds later, and I cannot say how long, could it be two seconds, five seconds, five minutes for all I know. I, I think it's not five minutes, but I came back, you know, as we say in the, in the science of consciousness, lights on. So lights on, I came back. Who decided to switch me off? I didn't take a conscious, logical, you know, well-articulated decision of switching off. And how did, did I switch on again? It was not me, me meaning myself, what I consider Nikos as an everyday lived experience. It was not me. Something else decided to switch me off and then decided by itself, according to some algorithms, to switch me on. So this experience uh, helped me understand that maybe we are not as much as in control as traditionally we think we are. Maybe there are processes in there that are not just running in the background to do all the boring work so I can be the wonderful you know, person that I think I am. So it's not like back office that, that just runs some, you know, like temperature and metabolism and uh, sense of, uh, of, of, of uh, balance, but all the wonderful things happen in consciousness. That's not the story anymore. This story is outdated. This experience of mine put it very strong into my brain that if I want to understand what makes us human, um, how we decide and what um, influences our behavior, I have to go much deeper than the daily experience. And then these other things happened. And I will finish with this. Business and economics, special economics, and, and, and final economics realized this, Alyosa, lately. We care about behaviors. Actually, what is really all about is a behavior. Meaning, uh, I'm sure that Giga will agree that regardless how much a client loves me, if they never buy for me, who cares? Uh, the, the same with economics. If, uh, if somebody wants to invest so much, but they never go to invest, they will never record the investment as element of, of you know, the economy. The same with leadership and HR. I'm, I, I might uh, feel that my employees embody the values and the culture of the company in their own DNA, but their behavior is flat. So who cares? All of the things that I mentioned are important as far as they influence a behavior. And I think... Um, Neuroscience uh, and behavioral, uh, behavioral sciences, which are not exactly the same, but they are, they are related, uh, they helped us refocus to, emo to, to feelings and ideas and attitudes and opinions to what we actually do every day. And I think this is the good news for, I think, all the three perspectives, that finally we focus in what matters. And in order to find what matters, we have to go to the brain. But then what affects this decision of buying, not buying, investing, not investing? And you described this situation uh, with, with, uh, about a car accident. And OK, it's an extreme situation. Um, probably then this switch off related to some emotions, or I don't know, fear. And uh, if we are um, now speaking about emotions, how emotions can impact the decision about something. I don't know, Alyosha, you, you, you talked the last time, you talked about fear versus trust, of course, important in capital market. Yes, so there's, there's many of emotions that we can, we could discuss, but uh, 
one of that is fundamental, I think, is the person has to be an optimist uh, in order to invest something. Otherwise, if they weren't optimistic, if they weren't expecting positive outcomes in the future, say from their investment, they would probably consume the amount of money they earn today for goods that uh, will uh, will they, they will consume today, and and that, that that's it. If we want them to stop consuming and start investing, then they have to be optimistic. They have to expect that in the future it's going to be better. And so uh, uh, the fundamental trait, I think, is optimism that affects all of the other experiences. Of course, on the other hand, we also have things like fear. We could uh, have seen the probably the best case in the last 10 years or so was when the first wave of COVID-19 hit. Then all of a sudden, it, it was kind of almost obvious people experienced fear because they, they felt in danger and they felt the danger was immediate. And uh, one of the ways in, this, this, uh, in which this showed up was um, on the VIX index, the um, um, implied volatility index on the, on the options market that jumped as high as when the financial crisis hit uh, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. So these are, these are the two. And then we have all the other uh, uh, feelings as well, emotions, uh, even personality traits affect us. Uh, for example, in um, investing, one of the traits that uh, is actually turns out to be quite important is uh, uh, the sensation seeking, impulsive sensation, sensation seeking. This is the same kind of guys that would uh, ski down uh, down the uh, heli ski or went up the mountain and or uh, uh, jumped with a parachute and so on. So these are the guys that will then also be prepared to take on more risk. And for that, again, we, we turn the circle back in and uh, get uh, to the optimistic trait. Yes, you wouldn't jump off a plane if you're optimistic that the parachute is going to open and you'd land. Giga, how are you facing with uh, emotions and then, I don't know, sales impact and so on? Well, first, we, we see what Alyosha mentioned in behavior of people who saved in our fund. We have around 50,000 people uh, who saved with us. And this year, as Alyosha mentioned, volatility was very high in capital markets. Also, our equity fund went up. Now it's again up before uh, March, but in March, it went really down. You know, but And also, everybody who is involved in managing the money we were all, of course, watching the indexes, saying, oh, my God, da, 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 record levels, whatever. But you know what's the most interesting thing? That our savers, they didn't panic. Because majority of our savers, we are specific, because uh, companies pay for majority of people who are saving for retirement in Slovenia. And they actually, most people do not monitor their saving accounts every month. So basically, they never felt this volatility. We were feeling it who were managing their money, but they majority wise weren't even, they didn't know their money dropped, I don't know, 10%, 15%. So it was really amazing to see, we, but we expected this, that basically we had no panic from our savers, but we also countered that because we increased our communication with them. Um, we increased how we contacted them. We were saying to them, volatility is normal. You are saving for the long term and basically gave them more frequent, precise information to calm them down to counter this, what could be a panic. But let's say on our case, most panic would be felt by the people who are actually doing the investing than individual members. So it was really interesting to see this play out. And basically last month, there were again record highs and everybody is now in positive. And we, we will send to them on January their monthly annual statements. Basically they will say all is okay. But in between this happened. But most people in our fund didn't feel it, didn't make a change. They didn't switch from fund to fund because they can do it. You know, people then chase yields, but they didn't. So we are think, let's say on our business case, it was really good to know these things in advance because we immediately went on action and increased the communication. We were in contact with all of our biggest clients. We explained to them and we keep explaining to them volatility is normal. You are investing for 40 years ahead. So don't worry about monthly ups and downs. 
So you as a business can counter these things that could trigger panic with people and they would make them do the wrong decisions. The worst you can do when markets go down, you sell and you go to safe investments because when investments will go up and they always go up, just a matter of time, you don't get that momentum going up. So this is what intuitively every naive investor does. When markets go down, they say, ah, oh, I knew it, they're gonna, they, uh, they, they rip me off. Uh, I don't trust them. I will sell this and I will go to bank and put it in a deposit. And then half year later, markets will go up. You will say, ah, oh, again, oh, they, they know more than I do. They double crossed me. So the main thing in these situations is don't go with your emotions. If you know you're investing for my pension, which is 40 years ahead, a monthly up and down doesn't apply to you at all. And it's best to ignore it. I think Alyosha wants to say something. Yeah. Go. Let me just uh, uh, clarify. Yeah? The reason we are here, one of the reasons we are here today is what Jiga was now explaining. This is not part of any traditional economic or finance theory that we had. There is no room for feelings in a way. Oh, I, I knew it. I'm disappointed. I'm going to take the money out. No, everyone behaves rationally there, but just in theory. As soon as you move from formulas into real life, you realize in our world, this is called the R square is so, so small, meaning that there's so much else we need to know that isn't covered by the formulas that you basically, if you are inquisitive mind, you have to dig in and start, start thinking about what else is there that I don't yet know. Uh, we have one question from the audience, uh, probably for, for Jiga and Alyosha. Uh, does media play a big role when we talk about the fear, because you were talking about the fear, and it feels like we get even more scared when we are constantly exposed to negative news? So media infects fear and we can see the impact in, I don't know, capital markets or, or sales and investing and so on. So the term media is very broad. It applies to all the communications that the companies themselves issue down to the tweets that people send around. And so it, it now depends on what exactly would this specification be. However, what we do know is that media does play a very big role. For example, in the, in the case of, of tweets, this is an obvious source that people, where people study how the media affects the stock markets. We know that if, uh, uh, if there is lots of positive feelings about a company, the company will, the, the share price of the company will go up. If there's lots of negative expressions in that, uh, the company share will go down, but it's broader. Because if companies communicate in uh, positive uh, terms, it's, this is associated with share price increases. If companies discuss their uh, results in ambiguous terms, in terms that don't convey the exact meaning, then the share price will go down. And these effects um, appear to be small, but they appear also to be important and systematic. So yes, uh, media does affect what we do, uh, we, what we do quite a lot. This is the general. We can go into detail really later. Would you like also to comment fake news or we should uh, leave, leave that out for today? Well, uh, fake news. Uh, what fake, fake news does, it, it depends on the specificity, but it, it has the power to affect things negatively as well. Um, uh, the point is if, the, if, if they appear credible, then uh, the capital markets might take it as a sign of, uh, at the very least, uh, uh, insecurity, and that means effectively that they increase a the discount rate, and that increased discount rate would lead to lower prices in general. Only one more question, because I know that once you were um, researching the correlation between um, among tweets and capital markets, what was the outcome? Uh, the outcomes in terms of tweets are about one to two percent of abnormal earnings. So. Uh, if the share price would go up by 10% on its own because the company is doing well, and there were lots of tweets that were positive about the company, the share price would go up by 11%. And so uh, a one percentage point difference in capital markets means a huge amount of money. Uh, Giga will probably be able to tell us how much exactly, but it's billions and billions that flow away in, uh, in one, just one percentage point difference on returns. Yeah. So this is the scale of the effect. It appears 
relatively small, but because it's multiplied across so many periods and across so much value, then uh, the economic effects are actually quite big. Let's move to, to people a little bit. Nikos, what happened now in, in our behavioral and what was important for, of course, leadership decisions and so on? Um, what, what caused the last crisis or the last situation? Uh, so b before I go to this, a little bit uh, on emotions, because uh, I think this is, there, is a, there is a very, unfortunately, emotions, talking about emotions is extremely challenging because we use this term every day, but for neuroscience, it means something else. So um, I, I believe I'm, I belong to this group of scientists globally that believe, and they are kind of majority at the moment, that an emotion have some specific manifestations, okay? And this will help me answer the question that you just uh, asked. So an emotion, first of all, it's not a feeling. And that's a big problem. We feel something and we also call it emotion. But there are two words. There's emotion and feeling. Is it the same thing? It's not the same thing. Otherwise, we'll have one word. Okay. It's different things. So I belong to this group of, of people that believe that an emotion represents in the brain a basic motivation, a reaction to a, to, to a trigger could be positive, could be negative. This way we have positive and negative emotions. Okay, we have also neutral. Okay, so it, it has a basic unconscious um, um, firing up of a specific system that is there evolved for a specific work like threat, for example, threat, huh? that we have a threat management system. So fear, anxiety, stress are a part of what is called the emotional reaction to threat in the, in the brain. And we have for other, for many other things, I mean, not only for that, but there's a basic system in the brain that in the unconscious and very fast reacts. Then there is another element, which is what we experience as human beings, which is actually feeling equals a sensation. And maybe it will be interesting to, to say that um, there are feelings which are not emotional. For example, what if I feel hungry? Is this an emotion? Feeling hungry is not an emotion. It's a homeostatic feeling, it's something else. Or if I feel pain, that's not an emotion but it's a feeling. So there are various types of, of feelings and three, four categories of feelings. One of these is emotional. So when the brain reacts in its basic fear or threat, threat management system, one of the consequences on this important emotional system in the unconscious is also to have a manifestation on our, on our uh, body, which is the sense of fear, the feeling of fear, or what's called an emotional feeling. And this is not the end. There is another element, which is the behavior, what you do about it. Okay. So discussing about emotions is difficult because unfortunately, um, in, in, in normal life, we use emotional feeling equals emotion. And the problem is so big that top neuroscientists like um, Joseph Ledoux, who is the, the top authority in amygdala research, he said that maybe we should stop calling emotion the basic unconscious reaction because we, we confuse people. But there are others like Antonio Damasio and the rest and, the, and everybody that believes in the basic emotion theory like me that say, no, no, we should keep the emotion because emotion means motion, means movement. Actually, our brain always feels emotions. Always. There is no way that a human being can switch off the emotional brain. But what we usually in our everyday talk about is, inten is the intensity of emotion. So when, if you are in a class and the kid is too emotional, you say, don't be emotional, but we mean don't be aroused. Don't have intensive, intense emotion, emotional reaction. But unfortunately, we say don't be emotional, which is catastrophic because morality is an emotion, empathy, especially this, uh, this contagion part of empathy is an emotion. Okay, so motivation is an emotion. So by saying to a student, by saying to a, a, a colleague, by saying, don't be emotional, you actually say to, you tell them, be immobilized, don't move. And this is the second thing about emotion. So they, uh, really, I mean, dealing with neuroscience, the last 15 years of my life, the most difficult and, um, and confusing topic to talk about is emotions. A, a theory and research is there in, in, my, in the second edition of my book, Neuroscience for Leaders, we, we try to do our best job to explain what I just said, okay? Uh, but still, I understand that if, if for more people is confusing. What does this mean practically for what you asked me? The role of, if we agree in calling these basic reactions of the brain emotions, 
okay, which, as I said, most of, of neuroscientists agree, not everybody. Actually, there is one, this Lisa Barthel believes that there's no emotion in the brain. It's all the, only the body and then the reaction. She says emotions, you just, they're just created and disappear. She's a little bit, I mean, an interesting theory, but a little bit uh, on the extreme side, not many other support. What does it mean though? It means that the basic function of the brain is to crunch the information that comes in from the outside world and from the inside world, and based on some protocol it has to create the best behavioral response. Okay, this is what it's all about. Not thinking, the brain is not made for thinking. Actually, Lisa Barrett just <laughs> had an article in your New York Times with this title. Don't, uh, brain... don't sell this to kids, right? Yes, okay, the, the brain is not for thinking. Thinking is, 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 uh, is, an, is, a, is a subsystem, a great subsystem, a nice subsystem, but it's a subsystem, okay? There are many other systems. And what motivates the brain to act is these basic emotional systems in the brain that have to react very fast in milliseconds and help us avoid threats, take, uh, take advantage of opportunities and achieve not only survival, but thriving. This means emotions, I'm not talking to feelings about things, emotions, these basic reactions of the brain are what makes us move in life, what motivates us, what help us go through difficult times or what motivates us to react wrong. What stops emotions is thinking. Thinking has an inhibitory, um, inhibitory analytics, has an inhibitory um, process, it's an inhibitory process in the brain. And this evolutionary is, is fantastic because imagine I come out of my cave. If I just like an animal run around to catch something to eat, the possibility that I will be eaten by something else, it's higher. I might succeed, but I might be eaten also or fall off of the cliff. But the fact that I stop and think, I literally immobilize myself. I disconnect with, from movement, muscle movement. Okay, It gives me the opportunity to analyze uh, various scenarios and then help me to achieve my goals better. Okay, So thinking is stop. Emotions is go. So in this crisis and crisis like this, because they create unpredictability, uncertainty, they create fear, stress, and anxiety. Usually the effect of the brain is a stopping effect. Uh, the brain goes out of, it is, of its traditional or normal homeostasis. Homeostasis is your baseline, okay? You are not in your comfort zone. You cannot predict tomorrow. You cannot, you, you cannot rely that maybe you will have a job two days later. Maybe you will lose your client. So there's a lot of stress and predictability and a new normal. You know, I have to work from home and I look in a, in a screen all day. And all this creates this um, negative reaction to the, to the brain. Fear, stress, anxiety, which are normal and healthy. Fantastic. These are reactions of the brain that help you, help you understand that something is problematic. However, how are we going to solve this makes the whole difference. And leaders are responsible to motivate emotions, create the right triggers for the brains of their employees, their colleagues, and themselves. You have to do it on yourself to move in the right direction because you can move in the wrong direction, meaning create conflict, avoid work, become erratic, destroy your team. You can move in the wrong direction or you can move in the right direction and put hope back into people and help them address their fears uh, while they are uh, created. If you allow fear to be present for longer time, this is where problems exist. So to summarize, emotions is a very difficult uh, scientific topic mm, because we use it different every day. Emotions for more is the, the basic motivational reaction of the brain. And this is exactly what we experience now in, in corporations globally. Zoom fatigue, stress, alienation, all these are new situations for the brain. And leaders need to motivate, not to explain, to motivate in the right way their people to get out of this crisis even stronger than before. But if I may challenge the, all three of you a little bit, um, I'm somehow I'm confused as not a specialist in neuroscience. You say emotions, yes, on one hand, and switch off emotions on another hand, and you need to stop and think for some questions and you shouldn't overthink for other questions. So where is, where is the balance? One of the things that Nicolaus mentioned, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure whether we were gonna pick this point up or not, was the issue of morality. It seems a trivial question in everyday life, in the business life, but 
it's actually one of the, the most important things nowadays, because if you think of the autonomous cars, we have the technology, but the car will drive by itself and it will also have to decide in difficult situations. And so unless we understand the process through which we're going right now uh, uh, in our brain, we won't be able to uh, uh, reap the benefits of the technology that's coming out. And, and so I see it quite clearly that we need to go into this understanding deeper than we are right now. And maybe if, because we, we started with some uh, like tools or, or actual like real cases, what happened in your business. Um, could you give us some tools how you actually made an impact you wanted to uh, by using neuroscience in, I don't know, let's say Giga in sales in, in your case? I think I would just tie to what Nikos nicely pointed out and I think explained fantastically how you go from emotions to fear to action. And I think also what you can do in your business, let's say what we do in ours regarding investments, you need to stop and you need to think. When emotions flood over you and they do and it's healthy and it's the only normal, if you don't have them, you belong somewhere else, <laughs> not in the office. There are also people in the offices like that, but for sure not a healthy working place. You need to stop, breathe, maybe take a few days breather, calm down. In our case, look at the numbers. We immediately in Jan, uh, March, when the epidemic went, you go study, how do epidemics go? What's this? Don't be afraid of it. Start to rationally understand it. Really think it in long sessions talk with others so you get other views. Uh, don't just, you know, lock yourself in your view and in your panic, calm down and then make a plan and, of your actions. And if possible, make a plan for what you will do in the future. Let's say we know markets will drop considerably and we say, okay, when they will go past a certain number, we will start buying because that's where you make money. I did it of myself. And then when the tough moment comes and you actually have to pay your own money or a lot of the company's money, which is really hard, then you need to say, because you get fear again, you say, oh, what if I'm wrong? What, oh, what, I, I should do this. I know this, I said this a week ago, but oh, it's tough. It's easier to do nothing, it's safer. You still need to stick to your plan. You say, we're gonna do it, we're investing. And then it's so hard when you do it because it needs some times that your decision will become true. Markets will turn again. You need to last through this whole time period and then they go up. But in the meantime, you're going to get a lot of aggravation from a lot of people. Why did you do this? It would be easier to wait. Nah, nah, nah. So I think it's really what Nico said. In times of panic, you need to calm yourself down, start thinking because that's why we have our brain not being a caveman running around. Uh, think, apply it to your situation. Uh, and I think what, when Nikos was describing it, you know, I remembered college years, you, you, you for sure sometimes end in a bar in a certain si situation with some overheated people. Doesn't matter how uh, fun loving you are, you have people like that. And if you don't stop and think, you can end up in a fight. If you stop and think, calm yourself down, you say, okay, we had enough for tonight. Have a good evening. I'm going to go. Things can go the other way. So I think really what Nikos pointed out was fantastic. Thinking to calm down and you need to do it in business. We see it in business. There's very little of thinking going on. I have to say it. There's a lot of emotional decision being done on the highest of levels. And there's really not a lot of thinking. And most of the time you are alone and it feels really strange. So this guts feeling or how we call it sometimes, you don't believe in that? Don't do it. <laughs> Before, <laughs> have a think about it. Rational no. thinking uh, and, and, and no. uh, it needs to be backed up by numbers, by facts and, and don't. Otherwise, you buy a ton of toilet paper uh, in the <laughs> panic and, and you feel perfectly safe. And that's your gut feeling telling me. When I went to the store and I saw there's no food there, I wanted to buy everything and I did a lot of it. Then I said, home, okay, calm down, man. This is gone too far, you know? The next day I was okay. But when I was in the store and I saw in March, nothing on the shelves. I went to, at 6 p.m. in the store 
it was nothing there. I said, call my wife, hey, go, go to a store, <laughs> buy some chicken and toilet paper, you know? And that was the wrong reaction. Of course, if there's fire in the building, you run out. But in business situations, we have a thing, as Nico said. So may- maybe because it's fantastic what Sika said, a little bit to, to uh, help answer your question Masa, Masa, as, as much as I can. So what is this interplay between, think, between stopping and starting? That's, that's the thing. And um, one of my favorite neuroscientists, um, John Barge, has a whole book about that. And I think he offers the best model, which is the following. It, 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 I will simplify, but I think it will help us a lot. It helped me a lot in life. And it, it represents most of what now Ziga just said. Um, because our, our intuition, uh, and there is a lot of discussion about this bias, and our intuition can go wrong. Of course, it, it, mostly it goes right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. Why do we have intuitions? Because evolutionary, they are, they are found to be correct most of the times, not all the time. But sometimes they go wrong and sometimes they go horribly wrong. Okay. So what is the best way to deal with this uh, stop-start mechanism? And, and he says something fantastic. He says, when you are faced with a situation, in order to make sure you do not choose something which would be catastrophic for you, use the stop and think to take the, the, the available options from 15 to three. I'll give you an example. You want to buy a car. There's so many cars in the market, but you might want um, through passion and uh, you know, intense emotions. We said emotions are always there, intense emotions. You want to buy a car which is outside of your budget, but a car that you love so much, but it doesn't fit your kids in the back. So in all the options that you have in life, there are obviously, logically, some options that are not good for you. And this is the and this is the first. So the first step is when you are faced with options, and when there is time, because sometimes the, there is no time, and you have to react very fast. And their intuition is your best friend. But when there is time, is to stop and say, okay, from all these options, which ones are the unnecessary ones? The ones that logically, if I put the things down, they are not for me. Maybe out of my budget. Maybe too too short, too small cars, too big, too this, too that. Okay. You, the remaining consideration said that any of this could be fantastic for you, stop thinking. Thinking now will not help you more. Probably you will be led to wrong decision. Many studies show this. Many studies show that overthinking leads people more often to wrong decision than to correct decision. So as soon as you use your, 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 um, your analytical thinking to make sure that the available options that are left are these that fit your situation, you need to then to listen to yourself very well. And there are many ways to listen to yourself. Take showers, go for a walk. Sports is fantastic for the intuition to come back to you. Sometimes even sleep and we say sleep over it. Eh? And there are many ways that the intuition, this, this heavy analytics of the unconscious brain will come to surface. And then why is this important? And this is why. Because if my deeper emotional brain make the choice between the one to three options, I will have the right motivation to see it through. If I, from the consideration set, I bring it to two, three, four, five options. And then again, with analytics, I choose. What is analytics? Is stop. It's not go. And this is the problem in companies. We explain to employees a lot of things, you know, to our colleagues. You know, we have this situation. We have this plan. This is what is happening in the world. Do you agree? They will say, yes, I agree. Or do you understand? Is there any misunderstanding, any, any data or fact that we didn't? And somebody might say, yes, I didn't understand. And you explain it again, or you discuss, and, and, the, and the situation is mentally, consciously, and logically clear. And everybody says, fantastic, it's everything clear and logically correct, let's do it. And then you see that things are not going. There's no motivation. Decisions that are made by your, your consciousness, do not, they are not supported by motivation. The best case scenario is when you listen to yourself, and this is something, you know, David Hume, David Hume, the, the famous philosopher and, and uh, philosopher of science uh, from the 19th century, he said, don't come to me to help you to find your passion. This is your stuff. But with logic, I can help you maybe apply it better. And this is the way to think between, between thinking and, and emotions, between stop and start. Stop is fantastic not to do some stupidity, but if you don't engage your start, You will not do anything in your life because motivation, and I'm not talking only about passion because passion is extreme motivation, but it can be calm motivation. Emotion, the moving part 
needs to tell you where to go. And the, the possibility of doing the right decision based on this, statistically in many studies that have happened, is higher than to overthink it until the end. So this is the advice I give to my students, to my colleagues, to my clients. Use thinking to make sure you don't do something stupid, but if you are happy more or less with uh, some uh, versions, follow your, follow your, 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 your inner, inner self. Maybe we should uh, also answer like um, shortly uh, some, some of the questions. Um, and now maybe Nikos, you can, you can go with this one uh, since you, you just started this. Um, does any one of you meditate for better control over your thoughts and emotions? So now you, you pick on me because you know that, that I'm against meditation and my no, no, no. so you pick on me. <laughs> but okay, let's and, and I know it's very unpopular what I will say, but uh, all the research that I have seen and I because I'm, I'm quite passionate of the topic, I, I collect a lot of it, shows that indeed um, uh, these techniques are, are helpful, but not always and most of the times not why people believe that they are helpful. Uh, meditation, for example, has been uh, compared with praying when people believe in God, and praying had better, uh, better results than meditation. Hmm? Praying for the people that believed. Uh, playing music together hmm? can have amazing effects, sometimes better than meditation. Um, when somebody has social anxiety, and there is, has been comparative tests between people with social anxiety where they tried to uh, uh, various techniques, one of it meditation, the other was, um, other are usually role playing. There was also some CBT, which is very famous, cognitive behavioral therapy. The one that, all, that wins usually is not meditation. Okay. And uh, um, uh, Richard Davidson, one of the top uh, neuroscientists that deals with uh, mindfulness and meditation, he says he has in his office a list of what meditation can help you with and a big list on what cannot do. Unfortunately, we live in a society which uh, we need a pill to solve everything. And the new pill, it's called the Buddha pill. Okay, the Buddha pill, because this, um, these techniques come from the East. So instead of taking uh, Prozac, you take the Buddha pill, which is meditated, and everything will go, go away. It's not like that. It's not like that. Actually, two things, and, and uh, I also want to take. First of all, um, there is a lot of discussion now in, in uh, research. And I'm not talking about the research for people that are in love with Nepal. This is a little bit, uh, okay, you can see it, but you know, see the other, and, and there is a fantastic uh, study, Alyosha, with um, uh, about the self-driving cars, yes. and uh, the moral and the moral question, which is fantastic, but uh, uh, which includes also Tibet and monks. But uh, what I was trying to say is that um, first, meditation comes from a, a philosophical tradition, if not religious, that had very specific starting points, and the starting point of most of these Eastern philosophies is the deconstruction of the ego, okay? This is the center of these philosophies. And this is extremely dangerous because the ego, and again, please, when I say ego, I don't mean, mean egoist, extreme selfishness. I use it in the, into the psychoanalytic way, the Freudian one, where ego is the sense of self. A healthy sense of self is extremely important for a healthy brain and a healthy mind and a healthy press. So there is actually the recommendation that if you want to engage in these techniques, it's very important to do it under supervision and not the good appeal. You do it at home alone. The second thing is that um, I, I'm, I'm very positive for people to use what works for them. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Did you have a problem and meditation solve it? I'm with you fully. Bravo. I support you. Do it all your life. Okay, and this is and this is the first um, the first um, 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 wave of research that I mentioned. Mm. Maybe somebody puts the headphones and blasts death metal for all night, and and he and he or she feels fantastic. Maybe somebody, you know, uh, does meditation. Maybe somebody is exercising. Maybe somebody is going in a lake and looking at this at the lake and listening to it. So, and this is actually the, the conclusion of all this is that. Indeed, it is very beneficial for the mind to have these reflective, deeper experiences. If you achieve it through meditation, if you achieve it through dancing in the club, not now, hopefully soon again. If you achieve it, if you achieve it in any different way, fantastic, please do it, I'm with you. Alyosha, you wanted to add I, something? Yes, I, 
wanted to pick up on the things uh, Nicolas was saying. Uh, he said two important things that I, I agree completely with. One is that it has to be individual. So not all the things work for everybody, for sure. I don't meditate. That would make me nervous. But I have other means to make myself feel better. One of the things in Norman Tyson would do is I would go to swim. Uh, and another that I found basically recently was uh, I started to, to learn how to play piano now at this age. And it's one what about the, cooking? I see your pictures of Facebook. I also, I also cook. I also want to mention cooking. The, the uh, more, more absorb, absorbive, uh, absorbative one is the uh, absorbing one is the is, is learning to play piano. It resets the, the mind completely. Maybe, Giga, we can also answer the question from John. Uh, you said that you will comment it. So about savings, how applied to behavioral finance? Uh, and how it's connected to age or uh -huh. um, Yeah, I think here most what the industry can do is basically to design products that help people avoid those emotional pitfalls that they might fall themselves into. So let's say we have founds where you are transferred according to your age from more dynamic founds to more conservative because when you are starting to draw down your savings, you're supposed to be saving more, more conservatively, more savingsly. Um, so basically we have this life cycle funds that do all of the switching between funds on their own. So they don't need any input from you, the saver, because a normal member of a pension plan is no specialist in capital markets, even specialists in capital markets make mistakes, emotional mistakes, so it's better that you go on a predetermined path and you know, okay, I start when I be, will be 40, I will be transferred to a medium fund. When I be, will be 50, I will go to a conservative fund. And in times of panic like this, you just say, okay, I don't need to do anything. The fund is doing already on its own according to a predetermined path. And you need to think about it when you enter such a fund. Nico said, you need to calm down enter it and I say, okay, I believe this path is right. I'm going to choose it and then just leave it. When moment of panic grabs you, just again, stop, think about it and say, okay, I've got it covered. I don't need to do anything on myself and you can relax. So basically as let's say in, in investment management, a lot can be done with products that take away stress from individual members. So the only time they need to spend is when they decide on a certain product and then the product can basically take care on its own, not to let people, you know, have all the worries. So I think this is an extra added value of, let's say, also new smart companies that basically they can take away some cognitive load from people and save them from themselves. Um, and you can apply this in various fields. Let's say investment management is one of them when you can make big errors if you follow your intuition most of, of the time. Also, professional managers are no different about it. We are all human, we all panic. So if we don't have something set predeterminedly, we will also uh, do it wrong. So I think this is one area here which can really save you a lot of money. Uh, one thing that surprises me in this uh, line of research that we are doing here is there's one control variable that you always ask and it's it intended to be age. And because the question was related to the age groups. And so normally you would think, oh, okay, as I get older, I will gradually switch over to safer investment because I have less uh, time to live. I, I will have less time to consume. But there is a, an important component in, in people's minds, it seems, if you ask them, uh, how long do you expect to live? Uh, they will, some will say longer, others will say shorter. What's uh, surprising is that once you adjust that for uh, actuarial uh, life expectancy, there will still be an optimistic component in there. And those people who view themselves as, oh, I'll never retire. Oh, I will, uh, I will never stop working. Oh, I will uh, delay my retirement for as long as possible. These are the kind of people that will actually then be prepared to take more risk. And so their life uh, savings switches would then have to be more gradual. So this is one of the, um, the elements that I think we need to study more. It's always shaped on the side as a, a control issue in, in, uh, in studies, but actually I think it's, it's an important question on its own. But is this uh, fact or, or this 
yeah oh i will never retire or i don't know is this connected to fear to ego to i don't know no people seem to be that they are able to intuitively somehow understand That's why they don't want to retire because they enjoy what they're doing it seems and always so or you know you just you're you have a fear of missing out something then or oh if you had the fear of missing out something and you constantly live in fear this would more likely than not cause you to uh have a shorter life not a longer life mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm almost, I, I, I have no studies on the top of my head right now, but I'm almost sure that if we check this out, uh, those people would have a lower life expectancy compared to, to the optimist, really. I think a lot of studies point out that we are overly optimistic about our future lives. So most of the people think everything will be okay, our jobs will be okay, our salary will increase, my wife will always love me, kids also, for sure. And that's how we go through life. Because what Alyosha pointed out, there are various explanations for this. But one that's, that's I think, backed up by most neuroscientists now, Nikolaus can, can correct me, but from what I read is that if you would be a pessimist, if you would worry about your daily life every day, I will go to work, maybe I will have a car accident. If you wouldn't believe everything will be okay, this would be too much stress physically and it would be bad for you physically. So during our evolution, we're supposed to develop this optimism over optimistic look at, at future life because it, it enables us to live normal lives. Why would I now study new things, read books if I will think I will die in three years? This would have such an, some, some claim that this would have such an emotional effect on us that it will just ground it to, to a halt. And if I'm not mistaken, um, um, if you lack this optimism, basically you're suffering, you, you have a mental illness. This, this, this is how, how it is, because you can't function normally every day without this overly optimistic outlook on life. So this has various uh, influences on our everyday lives from many choices. Yes, but the portfolio studies show that uh, a certain degree of optimism is, is okay. So to, to start saving and invest in equity is okay. However, being overly optimistic then uh, has contradictory results. Yes, you, you, you take excessive risk as a consequence of that. So risks that are, that are outside of what you could rationally expect to be compensated for. So yeah, just short to add, and then uh, Nikos, you can go. Uh, I think one, one biologist had a fantastic quote on this. He said, uh, optimism is like red wine. A glass a day is good, a bottle is not good. So I think this is the best way. Op optimism, we can't function normally without it. Excessive is not good, of course, but a normal dose of optimism, we all have it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking now <laughs> to each other. I would be home like covered somewhere. <laughs> Maybe if I if I move on to, to the next question, but I think it's connected to the topic and Nikos, I will uh, point it to you. Uh, what is the right way to motivate people? But I will add something else, which is, uh, it's, it's my question. I'm just adding it to it. Um, there are people who say to me, everything will be okay. And I believe them and I'm motivated. And there are people who say everything will be okay and I'm, I, I don't believe them and I'm not motivated. Why, what's happening? What's the difference? I think you answered the question, uh, Masa. I, I'm, a big, <laughs> uh, I'm a big supporter of what is called the social brain theory. And the social brain theory says that uh, the, the human brain is developed as it is, not because, but the consequence is that we are extremely dynamic um, um, and multi-leveled uh, social beings. And we have such, um, such complexity of social relations that no other species on this planet can come even close to us. Why is this happening? Um, because we have this bigger information crunching capacity. We have a bigger prefrontal cortex, this frontal part of our cortex in, as a relation to the rest of the brain than any other species. Of course, if you take a whale, the whale has a bigger prefrontal cortex, but it's smaller in the relation to the total brain as, as we have. Okay, and this gave to, to humans a bigger ability to imagine. Imagination is, 
not thinking. We say thinking because it is thinking, but the actual process is imagination. Mathematics, the, the ability to stop and think. You remember when I said, I, I'm out of my cave, what do I think? I, I, and I, I did it on purpose. I said, I imagine different scenarios. If I go like this, the leopard will eat me. If I go like this, the other tribe. Is imagination the actual um, um, process that, of course, leads to everything, to mathematics, you know, because I stop and think. The, like, like Einstein, he was imagining what is happening in the universe. Okay. So it's, it's imagination. This capacity to, it's called uh, mental time travel huh, in science. So the capacity to stop and instead of running like an idiot, uh, to, to mentalize the future, see what is possible to happen and mentalize the past. But the most important uh, effect of this is that it allowed me to create relations with Masha, with uh, Ziga, with uh, Alyosha and with Yana in a way that no other species could. In, in what way? I can be the best friend of Alyosha in the morning, but we go to play basketball in the night and we fight to death. And then in the morning, we are the best, best friends. This no species can do. There is no species, in, in most of the species, either somebody is the alpha, let's say the closer to us, prime is either the alpha male and either you fall or you die or you are excused, okay, or any other one-way relationship. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you, and now, now we do, cannot go to the office, but let's say you reach your office, you already collaborated uh, 100 times since the morning. How? Maybe you took a taxi, you collaborate with the taxi driver, the taxi driver has to be there. You went out and the taxi driver stopped in traffic light. Somebody pulled the traffic light. All this needs collaboration, means the, the cooperation between society and different parts to make it functional. There is no other species, not even bees and ants do this. And I can go into deep biological discussion about this. So in order to motivate somebody, they need some elements. Uh, my favorite model is by Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink is a consultant. And um, he's, he's a person that most of his ideas, I see a big um, correspondence with psychology and neuroscience, etc. And uh, he had a very famous book called Drive, where there he says that in all the, the modern science of, of motivation, and I exclude Maslow, okay, the modern science of motivation says that a person to be motivated at work, at work needs some elements. One element is autonomy, so not micromanagement. Do you want to kill somebody's motivation? Micromanage. They, they, the brain uh, unconsciously outsources many things to you. Okay, so they, they cannot feel this, this uh, full, full drive. So autonomy. The second one is mastery. Mastery in psychology is the ability to achieve goals hmm? and to be better constantly at this. So learning and development. Do I feel that in a specific job, the ecosystem that I live allows me to achieve my goals and to become better at it? Okay. And the third one is purpose. And I think that uh, Simon Sinek, Golden Circle, and blah, blah, all this discussion about purpose, it's this internal self, self, um, sense of fulfillment that somebody gets from their work. As a leader, if I make sure that I empower my people, that I help them to achieve mastery, and I, I, I allow or I support, or I even provide the purpose to have this more than myself fulfillment in life, these three are powerful. Of course, we can go into details on any of this and many other details that I have in my book concerning specific moods that motivate and moods that do not motivate, et cetera, et cetera. But the autonomy, mastery, and purpose are three things that science quite agrees on to motivate people. Um, Alyosha, Nikos just mentioned that we are the only species which and so on. But we are also probably the only species uh, for which the, you actually, you, you uh, search this field, that beautiful people performed bad, perform better. What's about that? <laughs> it's not that they perform better, it's that we think they perform better. And then they don't. That's the disappointing thing. And they don't, okay. <laughs> So the idea was always, it possibly comes from... Uh, Alyosha, is this, a, a, is this a dating tip? Yeah, because <laughs> I just wanted to ask, where are, the, where are we now, the four of us? So. The idea, I think, comes possibly from genetics, because it, it would seem uh, that um, uh, people, at least this is what, uh, what the early discussions were. Uh, so don't, don't take me for that these are my views, but it's how the, the uh, field developed that more beautiful people have healthier genes. And so they are better able to pass them on. 
but then the obviously the scientists try to quantify this sooner or later and the, uh, they uh, obtain different measures of what beauty means uh, and nowadays you recognize this stuff by if not uh, nothing else on your snapchat uh, accounts and snapchat filters that, that, uh, that uh, mimic your face quite good and this is the basis now by which we measure how uh, beautiful someone is of course we take more points the the troubling thing is if more beautiful people delivered a better performance that would be okay however from the studies that exist uh, up to now it shows that they perform no better than the others in fact some of the latest research um, shows that people who are on the opposite side yeah, so not the most beautiful ones actually appear to be better motivated and they perform harder and at the end they earn a higher salary compared to the others and so I think it's, it's an interplay of things. There is a, for sure, there is a health component and a, a, a genetic component to, uh, to help us, uh, but uh, motivation plays probably the more important part here. Is this maybe somehow connected to another question from the audience that we are also over optimistic how smart we are. Most people think they're above average in any field. So maybe this is based on, I don't know, good experience from past or, and then you are more optimistic. Ziga, you know about, about the, the uh, particular bias about that? Yeah, well, of course, this ties to optimism bias or what we were talking about before. We think we are better drivers than others. We think we will live longer. I'm of course a better driver than my coworkers for sure, you know? So this, uh, this all goes down to that over optimism about life. As also studies found out, I was looking at studies that uh, tell, they asked people, okay, when they will retire in America? This was a study and a lot of most said, I will re retire at 67 or later. And they, then they checked, it, it was a long study at this group, the same group of people, when did they actually retire? And that they found out most retired at 65 because of various illnesses something that didn't uh, was connected with their with something they could influence it was their health or health of their partners so basically it shows when you ask people now of course every youngster will say i will work until my death but if you ask them later they will still say okay i will work until later but life happens uh, illnesses happen to someone and it was the same with covid at the beginning everybody said i won't get it why why would i get it you know but people got it, you know, it's the same now. So I think, yes, but it goes, all goes down to the same thing because we need to look at it overly optimistic in order to function. So I think it's the same. Just regarding, just regarding the beauty, I wanted to say, I think I, I read somewhere that Darwin was most annoyed by the peacock because of his shiny colors, because he said it symbolizes beauty over actual ability because if peacock from evolutionary side of the feathers he wants to try to look the best for the procreation it, if he would like to hide in the forest this isn't the best way so it shows from evolution the peacock wins you know so this darwin was supposed to be really annoyed by this <laughs> but you you mentioned that uh, you think you're a better driver or you think you're a better i don't know worker or whatever but what if you are so what self-esteem? That's what we really believe. <laughs> and everybody here believes this, but we can't all be better drivers than ourselves. Yeah, no. We all believe it. I believe it for sure I'm a better driver than you. And you believe it the same. He's, uh, he's not better driver than me, but we can't all be better drivers, you know? The Actually, there is, is like a study, this. what Zika says is a very famous study, where they asked people, are you above average driver? And 90% of people said yes, and it's statistically impossible. <laughs> That's, we we are here this sample for sure. <laughs> but to say I something still, about opti optimism, I still do believe I'm a good driver. <laughs> uh, Masha, I think you might be. I, I want a little bit to flip the coin. Extreme optimism, even stupidly extreme optimism, is very important if you want to achieve some other things in life. Serial entrepreneurs, people like Elon Musk and uh, and Steve Jobs, they had optimism and and confidence in their abilities. What to do much higher than. Uh, normal, in, in, in a, I would say borderline narcissism, even not borderline narcissism. And actually narcissism 
is a basic element of entrepreneurship. Of course, I'm not talking about narcissistic personality disorder because narcissism is a no normal personality trait. When it is too much and extreme, it becomes a disorder. So scoring high in the narcissistic traits test is uh, associated with uh, strong entrepreneurship. And we live in economies where startups, disruption, you know, tech, we try to go to teach it to our students. We got, go now to schools and say, you know, startups and tech. But we cannot do this if they are cool, if they are calm, if they're too rational, forget it. We would not have what we have today. So extreme, stupidly extreme uh, op op um, optimism is actually for some things necessary. Alyosha, Otherwise, you... they, would not, um, they, they, they would not eat te uh, 10 times, hit themselves in the wall and try again 11. They will yeah. Do it. yeah. Maybe just one one technical question or, or more related to business, and then we will we need to finish. Unfortunately, we are uh, now a little bit late. Um, Nikos, you once said, "Don't use the facts and emotions in the same ad." Why not? What happens? <laughs> Fantastic! My I'm so happy you remember this. So there is a, the, uh, this is called the Carnegie Mellon um, experiment where they tried to see what motivates you more, facts or emotions, feelings in this sense, okay? And uh, they made this scenario where you need to, uh, you, you participate in a research, irrelevant research. You are invited to go somewhere and answer a questionnaire about cars, about, um, you know, refrigerators, doesn't matter. And in the end, they gave you an envelope with $5 in. And they, this was accompanied by a letter uh, some of them got a, a factual letter, like, uh, please donate some of these $5 you got because uh, 7 million in Africa die, 100 million there are die, so many percentage of kids could not. Uh, while the other half took a letter, which is a personal story. Rocky, I remember, was the name of the, of the child in Africa who she suffers and please help Rocky. And when they took back the envelopes to see who donated more, uh, twice more, uh, donated the, the, the more emotional, touchy feeling um, letter than the uh, rational one, which is kind of expected. But they then said, okay, what if the combination was even stronger? So they did the research again and they put both letters in, both the, the, the logical and the emotional. And when people opened and then donated, they actually donated as little as, uh, as in the rational one, not as the emotional. So actually, this, uh, and then they did some, um, some extra, not to take a long time, they did some extra steps and they actually found out what I talked about inhibition. When you, when you make my brain think, biologically speaking, this um, is demanding energy-wise. Actually, the brain is a big energy, uh, energy management system. And uh, it takes energy from, the, from some deeper parts that provide the motivation in order to stop and give room to analysis then don't expect motivation. Don't expect um, participation in uh, volunteering or, or in, ch in charity or in CSR or, or, or when you give facts. And if you try to play it clever and say, Haha, I, will, I, will, I, I know how to trick the brain. I will put the emotions and then the facts. Actually, the facts will kill the emotions and you will stay in the little effect of this. So we need, we need to be extremely careful when we create what we call the message architecture. You know, every... Every communication has a variety of messages. We, we just don't, don't throw there arbitrary and randomly. We have to create an architecture and we have to be very careful which element it's where in order to make sure that you motivate all the necessary parts. Actually, we, there are four parts you need to motivate or, or you need not to motivate, to satisfy for behavior to exist. You need to satisfy the thinking part. If you don't satisfy the thinking part, analysis paralysis. So you need to satisfy the thinking part to sit aside. This is what you want for, from logic. Logic to say, okay, and just stand on the side. Because if, if logic doesn't stand on the side, I cannot come. The emotional, the, the basic emotional motivation, you have to make it easy. So the context, the behavior, and what we talked about the social brain is the relational part. So uh, cognitive, emotional, behavior, and relational are the four elements every communication has to tick to make sure you get the behavior you want. So in, in one sentence or in one word, in the structure, in the message, emotion, message architecture, yes. Yeah, the emotions on top or on the bottom. So you see, this is why I'm always trying to avoid this kind of specific <laughs> tips because then people try, 
it's it's you have to understand and feel the room you need empathy you have to understand the situation you have to this is now this is now the political answer you know, you know, <laughs> no but it's true if if your clients and this is why we do neuro research okay i have tested more than four five thousand seven hundred now brains around the world you need to understand the state of mind and emotions of your target group and apply the best the best approach usually i would say you remember what john bart said usually i would say if you start with emotions and then add um, uh, data, as we mostly do, I think we will kill motivation because what remains at the end of the message is the logic, is the emotion, which is the stop and think. So if I had to choose, I would do the opposite. I, like John Bart said, start with the with the um, rational to to make sure you take rationality with you and rationality sits aside for the system to move and then hit them hard with the emotions. Uh, yesterday we presented the study, excuse me, the neuro study. We presented it on CSR messages because it's very relevant to what you said. And we found out exactly this. Many CSR messages, you know, we care about the environment, etc. They give a lot of data and especially they finish with the data. And that's not good architecture. I, uh, I think I will need to invite you again in a month. <laughs> maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, Alyosha, you know, what yeah. do you want to say? Yes, I just want to add one thing. This is how I see finance and accounting. We, I think, have to start from the formulas and the models that we have. And so this constrains us, this forces us to use logic and think through what logic can we expect. But then the next step is to realize that there is this empty field that we still need to understand and feel. And it's in here that we fit in, the, in terms of behavioral economics, uh, and it's in here that we feel it with uh, neuroscience and so on. So this is my preferred hierarchy of how I think through problems in life. So maybe for the conclusion, um, for each of you in, in a sentence or two, what do you think that the neuroscience will bring or how it will affect your field of work? Giga. If I, I think it can hugely uh, improve our work but we need to put enough time on it, um, enough um, and test what Nikos was saying with the messages, with the architecture. So in we your case, it means sales? Testing. We, we also, let's say we redesign our forms or our, our web portal where clients monitor their assets and then they can make choices to increase contributions. We need to test and we test different versions and then see what Nikos said with message works best. We try to guess the best probable one, but we can be wrong. So we have to test three versions, proof next month, test and keep the best one. So we need to test and improve. And also I would really emphasize to share the knowledge. These are all young fields, all young sciences, and we need to as much as possible share what we learn. So also other people can do it and apply it in their areas and then share again and, and improve services and for the people that use them. Nikos? I fully agree. Um, we live in an era of um, information, even information overload. It's not like before when we've heard something and then we had to go to a library to search, etc. Now information is all around. We just need the motivation. So if we, if, if we find it, it's very good how you find your motivation. Many people ask me, if you remember, Dave Hume said, don't come to me to find your passion. You find your passion, but come to me to help you. But there are ways to find your, your passion. And I think the best way is, is um, trial and error and exposure to many experiences. So if we manage today uh, to give you some possible ideas of how neuroscience and other brain and behavior related science can be applied, it's great. But if you motivate it to start your search, this is, this is best. So if you have the fire in you, you have now the way to, to progress. And uh, these amazing things, Masha and Jana, and uh, the, uh, it's not called the Faculty of Economics, right? The Ljubljana Economics and Business School, right? School, School of Economics. And School business. of Economics and Business, yes. The, the, the fact that we organize such things, it's amazing. And thank you so much for inviting us. Welcome, thank you. Alyosha? I will pick up from the information overload, a term that was in the clouds a few years ago. But three years ago, a regulator in the area that I work in, in my scientific uh, research, 
uh, issued a warning and it, they said that the annual reports companies are producing are actually becoming too complex to understand what the business is doing. And since then we came, so since three years, we came not only to, to the way that we realized that there might be an information overload. Now there is concern that the humans have actually started to write annual reports in a way so that the computers and artificial intelligence can read it better. And so this information processing stuff has absolutely real consequences for, for our work. And one of the ways in which we, we are studying this is by actually looking at what parts of the annual report do, do the readers actually see and which do they skip. And so it, um, even though we are talking about uh, a lot today about feelings and intuition and so on, this has very real consequences. And it's also, I would say, hard science in the end. It, it, it translates to numbers. So the information overload, as well as the facial expressions, as well as the feelings that we have, all in the end translate to, uh, to numbers, all translate into the way we, we calculate the uh, information in our, in our brain and also in, in uh, other systems. Uh, in the end, for me, it's not just that the technical part, I, I just think it's exciting to understand how people think about uh, economic problems, be it consuming chocolate, be it buying a house, be it driving around with, with a car, uh, be it jumping off a cliff with a parachute and so on. And I think this is the, um, uh, this will move forward the, <laughs> the, uh, the field of economics really. Thank you. I really hope to uh, see you again in uh, this kind of uh, occasion. And uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, also, thank you to the audience and all you were with us and to follow us on uh, cpof.su. And um, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>